So Josh, I was watching the news over the weekend. I saw that over that 48 hour period, there were over 265 acts of gun violence in the country. Man, that's crazy. It really seems to me that common sense gun laws could really help to curb this issue. What do you mean common sense gun laws? What do you mean? What do you mean? If you just try and enact common sense gun laws, you're just gonna punish people who obey the law. Bad guys don't listen to the law, so why would you enact more laws to punish people who do already follow the laws that are in place? Is that right? So what's next? People kill people, guns don't kill people? Yeah, that's exactly right. Do you not believe that? Listen, we need to have a discussion about how a Christian perspective could inform both the benefits and limitations of pro-guns. Okay, let's do it. Let's jump in. Guys, welcome to Kingdom Thinking. As you could probably guess, we're going to talk about Christians and guns today. So, Josh, as far as this question goes, we want to use guns as the central focal point to answer the question, what are two Christian perspectives on responses to violence? Sure. Whether that's to evil or to any threat that we're going to label here under the umbrella of violence, we're going to have two basic categories. One would be a proportional response, meaning you're going to respond to violence with uh, a violent uh response. The other one would be a non-violent response. Mm -hmm. So talk to me a little bit more about how the issue of gun rights and the merits of gun use relates to this. Okay, so a quick historical survey over what came to be America, right, in general. So uh, incredibly important document in America's founding, right, is the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, two Correct. of these most important things yeah. that we have. And mm -hmm. one of the most important articles that we still live by today is what's known as the Second Amendment. And this is what protects gun rights in the country. It comes right after the amendment of you know free speech. Uh, so the Second Amendment reads like this, right? A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. By? Just shall not be infringed. Right. By the uh, government, uh, by exactly. other people, the implication yeah, by anybody. Being by the federal government. Yeah. Good. And so we're going to be analyzing that Second Amendment discussion like you're talking about. And so when we look, uh, we'll start with the pro uh, kind of gun yes. argument here. Yes. Uh, the pro Second Amendment argument tends to specifically argue from a position of self-defense and freedom because of what we have uh, innate in us, these inalienable rights, right? Mm -hmm. That the government has no ability to infringe upon. And, and so these are called uh, natural rights sometimes, okay. right? And so quickly defined natural rights are rights that are not dependent upon the laws or customs of any particular culture or government. They're universal, they're fundamental, and they're inalienable, meaning they cannot be repealed by human laws, though one can forfeit their enjoyment through one's actions like I mean, if I violated your rights, right, I can lose access to my own natural rights. Correct. So uh, the pro-gun arguments from natural rights, we have life, liberty, and the pursuit of property, mm -hmm. right? And these are things that we find uh, in Scripture. So the idea of the right to life is very clearly, you know, kind of demarcated in Scripture. God is the creator and the sustainer of all life. We're made in God's image, and we're called to help protect and sustain life around us, right? Both our lives as human beings, but also we're called to care for the earth and steward its resources there. Okay. So we would see that for life, liberty uh, from the non, you know, Calvin position, Calvinistic position. God never forces people into relationship. God didn't create us to be robots. God gave us free will. And so if God is going to give us free will, why should the government uh, infringe upon that free will, right? So uh, why would I need to be forced into a situation that is antithetical to my well-being, right? So uh, why should I give you the opportunity to kill me when I know that me being killed is probably not good for me, right? <laughs> and then lastly, the pursuit of property. Uh, individual property rights uh, are as biblical as biblical gets, right? Like we know this, uh, you know, from this position, right? Yeah. Like we know this to be true. We have this, one of the Ten Commandments is do not covet your neighbor's property, right? So there's an inherent implication there that there is some type of private ownership that is unique to the individual that shouldn't be infringed upon or there shouldn't be a line that's crossed. So we have these inalienable rights mm. and the Second Amendment helps us protect, uh, helps us protect those things. Let's camp here for a little bit. The first thing that is highlighted for me as you read that is that n you have philosophical deductions of these what's called inalienable rights that are recognized in 
nature, if you will, mm -hmm. right, from a political perspective. You have these, what's called this category of rights, this category of qualifications of what it means for hu the ideal human living conditions in a society. <clears throat> and it seems that from this position, you not only have these philosophical deductions that are gathered from nature, but now you can pair that or you can fund that, if you will, with scripture to say, hey, this is how we arrive at a Christian conviction uh -huh. that a response or a defense against potential or uh, actual violence is properly or adequately with um, a proportional response with yeah. something like gun rights. Or yeah, and this is never something that's celebrated, yeah. right? Like people, and so again, in order to be charitable to this position, we never want to say like people are looking to go out and Correct. Like willingly <laughs> trying to kill someone or trying to get into a fight. Correct. You know, like, hey, come on my property. Like you should, I totally don't have a shotgun waiting for you, right? Like <laughs> nobody is assuming that line of thinking. No, that's right. In this. And then you combine that with the words of Jesus mm -hmm. in Luke twenty two thirty six, And this is where- Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, this is where things get super heavy, right? And so Jesus says to them, but now, if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. So he's not even just saying, like, if you have a sword, take it with you. He's actively saying, like, go out and get a sword. And the reason we use sword and not gun here is because Jesus didn't live in a time Correct. where gunpowder had been invented yet. Right. So how might that be interpreted for today's context? And so, yeah, buy a gun there, right? Go out and buy a 9 millimeter gun for a, protection a Glock. right yeah a glock nine or whatever i don't know gun things yeah there but it's like you know go out and get one to protect you yourself nice. and your family good 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 so again we want to highlight that this isn't we can't reduce this simply to a cultural conviction Correct. right or to some um social uh or demographic heritage thing mm -hmm. right it's not that there's actual line of thinking here that connects on the one hand um a political philosophy of what it means for a government to relate to or to be able to at least uphold and recognize mm -hmm. the humanity of its people and the consistency of that with some biblical principles, yeah, which is sure. fascinating, right? Fascinating on the one hand, because that seems pretty compelling on the one hand to say, hey, like that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now, here's where things get really interesting for me or where I maybe see some of the limitations. Um, the first thing is that from this perspective, it seems that there's a high level of optimism for the government to be able to recognize and protect those or to be the source from which you get those mm -hmm. rights. So what happens then if you live in a place where, and let's say you're a Christian, right? But you don't live in a, in a government that is consistent with those rights. So does that mean that is that warrant to demand that out of the government? Or is there internal conflict in the reasoning at that point where the government actually doesn't recognize those? Where yeah, we, I mean, early America thought it was, right? Like it was enough to go to war with the British Empire over. Right. Over there, and they, they did. certainly believe that God was on their side. Hmm. There, and like, I don't know, America's pretty cool. I like living here. And so it's <laughs> like, I mean, you can certainly make the case for that conversation, right? That if these things exist outside of government, yeah. then any type of government infringement uh, is a proper recourse and response would be potentially violent overthrow. Yeah. If that's what it took. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how well my musket will hold up to a tank today, <laughs> but certainly in theory, right, in principle, the idea could be justified. Okay, good. Are there any, what are some other benefits or limitations that you see? So uh, a couple other benefits or thoughts and idea is it does really seem to line up in the idea. And again, where I'm, I am speaking in this position specifically from the idea of self-defense, right? Correct. Never advocating As the last for first yeah. recourse. Like <clears throat> everything tried, everything else off the table, no other option. And so uh, this does seem to fit my mental conviction as a dad there yeah. and protecting my family. Yeah, your there. daughter's what, one and a half? Yeah, and so this is important to me on a level of being the protector of my home, right? Okay. Uh, and so uh, I don't quite know how to separate that, right? I don't ever want to do anybody any violence or harm. I don't ever want anything to happen on that. Uh, but this just feels natural huh. to me. It feels normal. Instinctual. It, yes, so much so, like, like biological, right? Huh. And the idea of like, 
I'll do anything it takes to protect my kid there. And if that means somebody else's life has to end because of what they're doing, you mm-hmm. know, to potentially putting mm-hmm. my life or my kid, my children's life in danger. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, okay. I feel like that's a trade I would naturally make. Okay. So the fact that it resonates so deeply mm. on some innate level to me yeah, uh, is compelling, is important to yeah. analyze and think about. Good, good. So not only do we have biological or instinctual responses to say, uh, or to validate the desire mm-hmm. to protect a loved one. Um, I think you also have historical examples, right? Where Christians, not only on an individual level, but maybe also on a grander level, have come in support of even stopping global evil from uh-huh. spreading, uh-huh. right? So, I mean, I don't know. If you think of a few world wars. Yeah. Um, if you think of... Even, you know, some wars after that, which admittedly are going to get messier, sure. right? But if the, at least in principle, the idea is if there is an evil that is spreading, you can do nothing. Right. Or you can stop an evil from further spreading. Yeah. I mean, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a perfect example of this, okay. right? Like, so, so, writer in World War II, Germany. Yeah. I mean, fantastic thinker, German pastor, yeah. right? Fled. Uh, to America and did his did some graduate work at college or at uh, in New York there okay. and then felt like he was convicted to go back and he himself wasn't inherently part of the plot to assassinate Hitler but he was connected with people who were mm-hmm. right and then he ends up getting caught and it ends up being you know like this failed and foiled attempt and he ends up being killed for it so Interesting. he definitely had mm-hmm. a conversation uh, in that realm yeah. of where it's like yeah, I mean, Hitler is obviously a horrifically evil human being. Yeah. So is there a moral thing to do to go and kill him and in, and in his life? Yeah. There? And a lot of people would have certainly said, yeah, absolutely. Mm. So all that we see here as examples from Christians, also kind of we talked about biological instinctual mm-hmm. response um, and some funding here from the Bible. There is a case to be made for Christian wisdom or Christian yeah. prudence yes. for the violent response yeah. against evil. Yeah. Okay. Now, on the other hand, you're going to have what we're calling a nonviolent response yeah. as an umbrella term for different ideas, whether that's going to be pacifism or a different idea of responding to evil or to violence with a nonviolent response. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what are some of the benefits or what is some of the Uh, pre-understandings that lay the groundwork for this view. Yeah, so most often we see these arguments being based on the words and life of both uh, Jesus himself, but also Paul the Apostle. So a New Testament ethic. Yeah, hugely New Testament in its origin, right? Okay. So uh, the position here affirms that Jesus is the ultimate example that Mm -hmm. Christians are supposed to follow, right? So Jesus says things like, we're to love your enemy there, and if you truly love someone, then you actually have no enemies, Mm. right? Uh, we're to turn the other cheek, yeah. and more specifically, we're to pray for the people who persecute us. There, and it's hard to do those things when you kill people, there, <laughs> right? Even if it's in a self-defense type of mode, right? So, uh, yeah, again, if you love all your enemies, truly your heart will change. You have no other enemies. Turning the other cheek is an intentional choice to both rise above huh. and refrain from retaliation of any kind, because yeah. it takes very seriously the yep. notion when God says, "Vengeance is mine," Correct. says the Lord, "I will repay evil for evil." Correct, right? Praying for those who persecute you is reminiscent of following Jesus' lead uh, when he's on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do, right? Instead Mm -hmm. of asking God to retaliate there. And so the idea here seems to be that as followers of Jesus, we're called to be a part of this subversive kingdom. Yes, that's a really key term. It's huge because the idea here is what is natural or instinctual to me may actually not be a natural and instinctual part of the subversive kingdom that Jesus is setting up. Okay. So my inherent biological urges to protect in that way are actually things that prevent me mm. from acting in accordance with both the example and the command yeah, that Jesus sets. That, that is fascinating. One of the things that comes to mind is how <clears throat> God's revelation of himself and his character happens throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so I had a professor once who talked about the law mm-hmm. and specifically the the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. And he talks about how the the law that keeps getting revealed in the Old Testament is contextualizing for God's people what godly living would look like. Mm -hmm. So you get the first generation of Israelites who are going to get delivered from Egypt. They get the the law at Sinai. Mm -hmm. Then, however, you get it again for the second generation, which is going to be in Numbers and Deuteronomy. And so the question is, well, why why reveal this again? Well, it's because they have to understand for their context what it would look like 
to live as if they're under God's rule and not exclusively by their surroundings, mm-hmm. right? And so the case could be made here, and, and this is really fascinating to me to think about that. Could the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, could that be an expression of kingdom living? Yeah. Or what the law would look like in this ideal reign where Christians and people of faith are not only dominated or not only oriented towards, like you were saying, right, these instinctual or biological responses, but there's actually a reorientation of those affections or a reorientation of those instincts so that it models the wisdom and the power of the cross. And that to me is really fascinating because, so Paul makes this explicit in 1 Corinthians chapter Mm -hmm. 1, and he's going to say, when people see the Son of God crucified, they see the Roman Empire who has defeated um, this uprising, who has defeated this this rabble rouser, mm-hmm. right, if you will, um, and you see uh, weakness, you see foolishness. Yeah. Because crucifixion is not only humiliating, that you would have been naked, exposed, it is also extremely painful. Mm-hmm. It's Romans were experts in torture. Mm-hmm. So you see weakness, defeat, foolishness. And Paul's whole argument is that The gospel is the reorientation of these values so that it's not foolishness, weakness, uh, powerlessness. It's actually the wisdom and the power of God being channeled through this paradoxical event and that that actually reorients all the values of Christianity. So from that perspective, then, the witness of violence of Christians on earth is should not be responded with violence, right? Right. But should be responded with this reorienting value that then actually has the power to change that. Now, you could see where this gets money, right? Because so would the implication of that be, well, the U.S. should have stayed out of World War II. Sure. Or, um, you know, if 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 your family is being threatened, you need to stand stand your ground. And that's uh, quite literally where I go with that. I don't know how like, how would that actually work? Well, because, so the idea of what Paul is saying here, it's through following through. It's because you follow through in whatever example that you're talking about that you see the paradoxical fashion lived out okay. appropriately, right? And so in this instance, so Paul is saying, like, if we want to be like Jesus, we have to participate and do the things that Jesus did. And mm-hmm. so if we follow that logic and line of thinking for the idea of defense for the family, that would mean that because I would uh, uh, adhere to nonviolence, I would have to let something happen. Right. Mm. Or I would have to just use the minimal force the and something could still, yeah, come out of that in a way that's negative. And I just do, like, again, I just don't know. Could you stomach that? I, well, I just don't know how many people are going to be like, that was a great Christian move, man, letting something happen to your one and a half year old daughter. I don't know yeah. what that accomplishes in that way. Right. Interesting. Uh, and, and again, I, I'll put, you know, I will put myself out here. Like, I actually think that the Christian call is pacifism. I really do. You that, do. Yeah. I'm convinced by this in Jesus's words and rhetoric. But I don't know how to. I genuinely don't know how to live this out well. Okay. I genuinely don't know how to live this out on an indi- uh, on anything more than an individual level, on okay. adult individual level, right? Because I feel well, empowered to make neighbor. that decision to lay my life down mm-hmm. there. But I don't know that I should be able to make that decision for a two year old, right. right? Like it's harder that for me. That you're directly responsible for. Yeah. 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 So that one's harder for me to live out this pacifism mandate that I yeah. am convicted of exegetically yeah. in any more than an individual sense. I don't know how you do it communally. Yeah. And I certainly don't think you can do it nationally. So the, the tension there on the one hand of the prudence and the wisdom that you could make a case for, yep. for protection and for self-defense as the last resort to a violence. And then this ideal that says, no, there's a reorienting of changing your neighbor right. when, when you respond in this way. I think what, what you see in the tension between that is actually a perspective of eschatology. Yeah. And so what I mean by that is a perspective or a conviction of how much of God's kingdom is actually here right now. Right. So I think there's clear examples in our world that we are not in the perfected uh, new heavens and new earth yet. Yeah, I hope not. Right? Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> it would suck. So, uh, in, in New Testament, there's this idea called the already not yet, mm-hmm. which means that there's a tension between God's power infiltrating and creating a new society from the inside out, which is the church yep. that is transforming the world, but it's also not yet. Right. And so to live in that tension, I think, is to acknowledge that there's merit to both of these. Yeah. 
And so you could have people who love Jesus, who love their neighbor, and are going to come to different conclusions on this. Yep. One's going to say, I'm, I take it upon myself to respond for the sake of protection and for the sake of love of my neighbor yeah. to respond with a proportional threat. Yeah, naturally. Um, and then there's, and I think there's going to be people out there who are going to say, no, I'm going to die by this principle. And so there's, there's consequences and costs on both sides. Yeah. Right. I personally think that the pacifist perspective is an over-realized eschatology yeah. perspective, meaning I think that from that perspective, you're understanding too much of the kingdom being here already, where there's too many not ideals that wouldn't facilitate that kind of living. I also will say from a lot of people I've talked to or just from random Facebook posts or whatever, that there's an under-realized yeah, yeah, perspective sure. on the other side, right? Yeah, where sure. it's like, no, we need to um, be the agents of, of this change. We need to once we're wielding this about. Yeah. And so... I, because it's through us that the kingdom becomes realized. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So, so you could put too much weight on that foot sure. as well. And so... Without making this arbitrary and without saying, well, you know, just pick a perspective on on eschatology, I think that there's there are real challenges out here. And I, there's an example that is really interesting to me from the Cold War, mm -hmm. right? Just, so maybe like 40, 35 years ago um, from a, a Catholic scholar. Yeah. And, you know, I really ap appreciate the, the ecumenical kind of inclination, right? The more diversity of traditions we can bring in the better. So tell me a little bit about this, this yeah. Catholic scholar. So uh, Father John Deere writes this article uh, for the National Catholic Reporter about the specific verse that we quoted earlier from Correct. Luke's Gospel, 22. right? Uh, and he talks about how it's often misread as a justification for war and yes. violence. And he goes on to explain how he thinks it ought to be interpreted, right? Okay. So the background of the contextual side is this. So shortly before his crucifixion, right, this is where that verse occurs. Jesus is praying in Gethsemane in the garden, and he tells his disciples that, hey, you know, one who doesn't have a sword should sell his cloak and go buy one so in response to this the disciples go and find two swords right and jesus says no okay like that's enough relax right and so as father dear explains the disciples simply didn't understand that jesus was not speaking literally he says that when his followers run off to produce two swords jesus barely kind of keeping the glimmer of light alive snaps and, and actually says like stop it's enough or a better translation he says is like ah uh, like forget it you know like you're not you're not getting it and so the misunderstanding is complete the scriptures foretell it and jesus resigns himself to it right it's part and parcel for the vocation that jesus is going to walk through essentially right Right. And so, but more importantly, uh, the gospel doesn't end there, and Jesus is going to continue pressing the matter, because when the crowd comes to arrest Jesus and Peter strikes the mm -hmm. high priest's servant uh, and takes off his ear, Jesus says, no, stop, right? Like, there's an actual act of violence that has occurred in Jesus's presence and he has gone out of his way to condemn it mm. there and he actually goes and heals the man's ear. Correct. And so, uh, the, so that, that should inform yeah, I mean, like, Jesus is nonviolent, right? Yeah. Like, the idea, and, and Jesus actually asks, like, what's with all the pitchforks and torches? Like, I was in the temple teaching all the time, you know, and, like, mm -hmm. you guys never came for me mm -hmm. then. Like, what's different now? Mm -hmm. And so if we take this, uh, what I like about what Father Deer writes, it kind of at the end of his article, he says, if we take this passage absolutely literally to justify war, then clearly the passage limits the entire world to only two swords, and we have to share them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I mm -hmm. think that's a really good way to look at this conversation yeah. is— uh, there's probably some type of theology of accommodation that has to come through this, right? Because we mm -hmm. are in this now, not yet paradigm that you described Correct. earlier, we have to have a discussion about the uh, unavoidable reality that is violence mm -hmm. to some degree. Uh, and when Paul talks about in Colossians 3 about putting love above all other things, mm -hmm. the question is, who, to whom does my love and loyalty belong first, mm -hmm. right? Or more, right? Like my daughter or the neighbor who's right. potentially trying to do me harm, you yeah. know? And, uh, dude, that's a, it's a hard rock. Right. It's a rock and a hard place, right? C correct. Because when you talk about things like gun violence, when you talk about things like school shootings, when you talk about things, um, ev even like, uh, the way that firearms are used, um, even in the like judicial system or police system, yeah. right? Like you're going to have a case that could be made on both sides. Sure. And so I think ultimately what we could say is ideally the Christian uh, way of living or the Christian kingdom living is such that uh, the disarmament, right, is actually not with a reciprocal response. Right. And, and we would also say that 
the violence is the outworking of a brokenness mm. that people have, right? In systems, in experiences, in families. And so our job as Christians isn't to just limit the scope of the conversation to whether or not our reaction to violence should be violence or nonviolence. Our response should actually be, how, how can we, we swim remedy? upstream and stop these problems Correct. from even beginning? Yes. Right? And, and so that's probably the best way to live yeah. in today's world as opposed to just like picking a side yeah. on this. It, it should probably be closer to like, how do we stop the problems that contribute yes. to and cause the violence to occur in the yeah, first place? Yeah, that's great. So I would encourage both of those perspectives to actually reorient yeah. or continue to then think deeper about that position and say, well, how do we then from the inside out continue to influence right. those infrastructures? Right. Yeah. Because it's a lot easier to live a subversive lifestyle when you don't have to do it in the moment of life and death Correct. situations. Correct. Correct. So what do you guys think? We have for you guys here two compelling yet contrasting views on Christians and guns. We want to know what you guys think. Leave us a comment. What did we miss? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you guys next time on Kingdom Thinking. Mm -hmm.